Hey, welcome back to Pop Culture Graveyard. I am Hollis, and today I'm going to bring you a heaping helping of underrated music documentaries. Some are pretty lo-fi, and some have much higher production values, but they all rock. So please join me for a big batch of underrated music documentaries. Don't you dare leave. If you're enjoying the content I'm bringing you and would like to help support the show, please consider joining my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash popculturegraveyard. On with the show. Up first, Westway to the World, The Clash, which I got back in my favorite record store in New York for $2.99, would be a bargain at five times that number. It is directed by Don Letts. Don Letts is a legendary figure in London. He was the DJ at the Roxy Club, where all of the punk bands would hang out. And he didn't have a lot of punk singles to play, so he would play the music he loved, which was reggae, straight off the boat from Jamaica. And he, more than any other person, is responsible for a lot of punk bands, such as The Clash and The Slits and others, embracing reggae. Don was also in Big Audio Dynamite with Mick Jones after The Clash broke up. So he is the perfect man to tell this story. He was there. And so often in music documentaries, you find them told by people who were not there. If you're very lucky as a director in music documentaries, the band members are very eloquent. At one point, Joe Strummer says, It seems to me that origination is perhaps instinct, not intellect. And he is exactly right. That is how you give birth to a movement, such as punk. Joe also talks about the chemical mixture of the four classic era members. Joe, Paul, Mick, and Topper, and how you could take one away and it's never going to work. How terrible that band members only gained that perspective in old age. No one appreciated each other, and everyone was in their 20s and had no communication skills. Those two things are a truism in 99% of the music documentaries you're going to see, and this is no different. That dreaded hydra of youth, drugs, ego, and stupidity broke up many, many bands. The Clash among them. Here's a perfect example. When the band were making all their classic albums, Mick got a kind of bloated ego, and he would always be late to sessions. And they fired him with great prejudice at the time. A much older, wiser Joe Strummer in his interview segment said, Talent is worth waiting for. That is the perspective that maturity grants us all. And Don really has a deft touch as far as using The Clash's music throughout. And I don't just mean sprinkling great concert footage throughout of some of their best-loved songs. It does that. But I'm even talking about incidental music off of London Calling or off of Combat Rock. Finally, all of the best band documentaries, I feel, have this one thing in common. They're all a little bit wistful, and there's an air of regret that sort of hangs over them. And this is no different. If you see only one Clash documentary, make it West Way to the World. Up next... Super Duper Alice Cooper. This was written and directed by Reginald Harkema, Scott McFadden, and Sam Dunn. Holy hell, is this fun. This film is one of the most thorough and action-packed documentaries I have ever seen. And it charts the rise of the band, as well as the man, known as Alice Cooper, from their humble beginnings in Arizona, through their rebirth in California, to their adopted city of Detroit, and finally world domination. This baby covers all the bases. Oh, you'd like to see some talking heads in your documentary? How about these? Iggy Pop, Elton John, John Lydon, and D. fucking Snyder. The original Alice Cooper Band is one of my favorite hard rock bands of all time. From the pre-Alice Cooper Band years when they were known as the Spiders and came out with the single Don't Blow Your Mind, to the band's later success with Schools Out and Billion Dollar Babies, this documentary is stuffed with stellar music. It's an inspiring documentary, too, because it totally demystifies the business of rock and roll. From the band's struggles back when they were living in the Chambers Brothers' basement, to their signing with Frank Zappa, to their star-making performance at the Toronto Rock and Roll Revival, the concert in which they killed a chicken in front of a beetle, every step of their rise to prominence is lovingly documented. Incidentally, the band's manager, Shep Gordon, who was instrumental in the band's rise to stardom, has a fantastic documentary all about him called Supermensch, The Legend of Shep Gordon, which was directed by Beth Alla and Mike Myers. So I highly recommend that as well. But if you want the definitive story on Alice Cooper, look no further than Super Duper Alice Cooper. 
How popular was Alice Cooper at the height of his celebrity? He knew Frank Sinatra, and Sinatra would refer to him as Coop. Hey, how you doing today, Coop? You're a cuckoo guy, Coop. Incidentally, if you want a one-two punch with Super Duper Alice Cooper, I suggest Good to See You Again, Alice Cooper. A fantastic concert from 1973, when Coop was at the height of his celebrity. This was actually released theatrically. You had to go to a theater to see this in 1974, and it's worth the trip. It's not just a concert film, but the band acts in it as well. And there are some funny set pieces, and you could even call some of the parts music videos. So good to see you again, Alice Cooper, is a fun companion piece to Super Duper Alice Cooper. Up next, Rock and Roll Won't Wait, Murder City Devils. This was directed by James Bazan and is an unflinching backstage look at what it's like to be in the Murder City Devils. This documentary is on the lo-fi side of things that I referred to in my opening. Way more lo-fi than Super Duper Alice Cooper. From beautiful band member Leslie Hardy introducing her dog during an interview segment to their lead singer Spencer Moody picking a fight with a homophobic punk out in the audience, all the highs and lows are documented equally. This is not just an underrated documentary, but an underrated documentary about an underrated band. Here's how charming the Murder City Devils are. The band members were all in the hardcore scene, playing very aggressive music in different bands. They then felt they wanted to break free and do something different. And so they formed a rock and roll band because nobody was doing that. And then they went out on the road and they discovered everybody was doing that. They were just in their little hardcore scene world and they couldn't see it. That's just one of the charming things about this band. The unsung hero of this band is the roadie slash road manager slash den mother known as Gabe the Roadie. Long hair, facial hair, and the trucker hat and the affable personality. He really kept the trains running on time for this band and seems to really love the band and is as much a member of the band as any of the players. This documentary nails the fly on the wall aspect of documentary filmmaking better than most. We see various concerts of the band out on tour playing with the band The Catheters in ridiculously tiny venues. Some of these venues, I was like, where's the fire marshal? <laughs> How is this safe? We also see them opening for Pearl Jam in the biggest concert they've ever had, in which the group joined Pearl Jam on stage for a rousing rendition of Sonic Reducer by the Dead Boys. My favorite moment of the band live is them opening for Motorhead in gothy stage makeup, and in Spencer's case, a cape. The band play a wonderful self-destructo set right before Motorhead take the stage. And almost as a callback to Alice Cooper, Spencer takes out a hatchet and starts chopping things up while the boys behind him slam their guitars into each other, breaking them. What do you want? Drinking? Fighting? Neil Diamond karaoke? It's all here. Rock and roll won't wait. Murder City Devils. Up next, Love Story. This is so much fun. This was directed by Chris Hall and Mike Carey, who did a wonderful job, as I'm sure it was difficult to wrangle all the members of the different eras of love together. They found the drummer and harpsichord player Snoopy out in the middle of the woods, it seems. All of the surviving members are interviewed. An important member who had already passed away at the time, Brian McLean, is still present in some wonderful interview footage in which he talks candidly about his time in the band. Some of my favorite parts about this documentary are when Arthur Lee takes us in his car on a tour of some of the most important places to him, such as Dorsey High School, where he first gained an interest in music along with Johnny Eccles, his best friend and guitarist at the time. Arthur later gives us a tour of the notorious castle, the Hollywood mansion that most of the band lived in back in the 60s. And he goes room by room telling you where everyone slept, among other things they did. Even John Densmore from The Doors is interviewed in this thing, saying our aim was to be as good as love. Jim Morrison had said the same thing about the band when The Doors started. Not only do you get the documentary, which is first rate, but you also get bonus interviews and outtakes with most of the band members. This has always been a mysterious and magical band. And while a lot of the inner thoughts of someone like Arthur Lee remain elusive, this documentary comes as close as possible to being the definitive overview of the band. Up next, Bowie in Berlin. This documentary is actually two discs. Bowie in Berlin, aka Ein Dokumentarfilm, 1976 to 1979, and David Bowie, The Berlin Briefings, 
which is a heaping helping of wonderful interviews with people like Tony Visconti, Brian Eno, and of course Bowie himself. But the main documentary is based on the roughly two years making up the better parts of 1976 to 1979 that Bowie lived in Berlin, Germany, and the albums his stay there produced. Those albums are usually referred to as the Berlin Trilogy, Low, Heroes, and Lodger. Though Lodger wasn't actually a Berlin album, as it was recorded in Montreux, Switzerland, on breaks during his 1978 world tour. This provides the kind of deep dive into music making that I always love in a music documentary, with not just the songs born of that period, but the inspirational motivations behind them, such as Kraftwerk and Noi. Add a little sprinkling of Iggy Pop, always welcome as Bowie's fellow artist in retreat, if not surrender at that point in his career, and you've got documentary magic. If you love mid-era experimental Bowie, you really need Bowie in Berlin. Up next, end of the century, the story of the Ramones. My God. When it comes to music documentaries, end of the century does everything right. Johnny Ramone said of it, it's accurate. It left me disturbed. Joey had died before this movie came out, unfortunately. And so when a rough cut of this movie was screened, I remember everyone that loved Joey was up in arms because there was not enough Joey on the screen. That was rectified by the time the final film came out with some wonderful interviews of Joey at home. This film perfectly balances the early pre ramones story with the mid-era Ramones and the death rattle Ramones. They don't give any era short shrift, which is rare for a documentary. I think my beloved Dee Dee Ramone steals this film, especially his sojourn into hip-hop as Dee Dee King, which has to be seen to be believed. It's got that wistfulness I talked about in the shape of the Ramones' hapless pursuit of a radio hit, trying producer after producer, always thinking the next one might have the magic formula. There are a few instances in this documentary where you see missed opportunities due to a band member getting hurt or something falling through, and you think that history might have been different. But it's hard to think of the Ramones being any more influential than they already are. And this documentary pays tribute to that amazing band with style and grace. Up next, Jandek on Corwood. I'm not sure if the odd solo artist known as Jandek is still a thing with today's younger generation, but my generation found him fascinating. He was this guy from Texas who called himself Jandek and he put out like 35 albums over the course of 25 years without a single live show or public appearance. I remember how almost overnight all these records with odd covers began showing up in used record stores in the mid-90s. Jandek had been recording since about 1978 or something, but it took that long for him to get any kind of distribution for his records. Jandek is a ghostly musical figure who plays discordant, atonal music with super odd vocal performances. Jandek is a musical pseudonym for a guy named Sterling Smith, though most of his music is credited to Corwood Industries, which is also his record label, Jandek on Corwood. This may be the only music documentary where the documentary subject is never seen. Not counting the last 15 years or so where he's allowed a few photo sessions, our only knowledge of what Jandek looked like came from shaky pictures on his albums. This is a documentary as ghostly and mysterious as Jandek himself, and I highly recommend it. A documentary subject almost as unique as Jandek is Gary Wilson in You Think You Really Know Me. The documentary takes its title from Gary's wonderful album, You Think You Really Know Me. I spoke about this album in my Most Valuable Records episode. This is a very rare album and features music that is wildly ahead of its time. This made Gary a beloved cult figure. I had the pleasure of seeing Gary perform live in the early 2000s. I believe it was at the Knitting Factory in New York, but wherever it was, it was a very weird show. I remember he used videotape to lash himself to a naked female mannequin, and he performed the show that way. But I digress. This is a wonderful documentary because it's almost like a detective story. This guy set out to find out who this wild character was that made that crazy album, and he does. Gary made that great album in 1977 when he was only 24 years old. If you get this documentary and you don't have the album, don't worry, because it is a two-disc set featuring not just the film, but a CD of the entire album, including liner notes. So if you like your musical figures a little left of center and down a block and two blocks over, you will like You Think You Really Know Me. But then again, I do not know you. 
The Filth and the Fury. This is the best documentary on the Sex Pistols, filmed by friend of the band, Julian Temple. It features archival footage that cannot be beat. And the Sex Pistols were really, really well documented. I mean, even before they put out their album. And that's some of the best footage here, when the band were just playing for their few fans, and even playing for a group of children. I saw this in the theater when it came out, and I left with a new worldview of the Sex Pistols. And Julian Temple made a great decision to do the contemporary interviews with the band members in darkness so we just see their silhouettes, so that the way they look now wouldn't be at odds with how we see them on the screen in their youth. A brilliant choice. I love the band member interviews, especially a mesmerizing moment when John Lydon is visibly shaken and crying, remembering how Sid Vicious's life was just thrown away essentially. And that's why, again, you needed a friend of the band. Because John even says Julian when he's talking, and he's confiding in his friend, who happens to be the director of this film. So you get those unguarded moments. Be warned, you get a heaping helping of Laurence Olivier as Richard III. But it makes sense. Okay, I'm going to fly through the rest of these. Slow Century. This is a documentary about pavement. It is a two-disc set. Disc 1 is a band history, and Disc 2 is a collection of pavement videos. The documentary is by Lance Bangs, no relation to Lester Bangs, and the documentary style really matches well with the aesthetic of the band, which is not always the case. It's a really nice package and a lot of bang for the buck. Turbo Negro, The Resurrection, for the uninitiated, one of their most beloved songs is... I Got Erection. This documentary is wonderful as it chronicles the 2002 reunion, or resurrection, of Turbo Negro, a band that had fallen apart due to a few reasons, one of which was their leader's trouble with drugs. There's a wonderful scene in this documentary where Hank, their lead singer, is waiting outside the rehearsal room. He's about to go in and see all these guys for the first time in forever. And he's talking to the camera crew and he's like, what if they blame me? What if they just jump on me and they're like, you're, you're the reason that we fell apart, you and your damn drugs. And, and he's like practically in tears thinking about it. I love real moments like that in documentaries. He of course walked in and everybody was sweet as could be to him. But what a great moment to give us. And there is some great history and some great concert footage in here. If you love them already and you haven't seen this, you're really missing out. If you don't know them, this might be a bit much. We Jam Kano, the story of the Minutemen. Talk about lo-fi. You're just basically driving around with bassist Mike Watt and learning all about Dee Boone, the late great Dee Boone, and George Hurley, and the wonderful band that they had. There is so much great footage here of the band playing out, playing ack, 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 this ain't no picnic, Corona, so much great footage. From Grant Hart to John Doe to Richard Hell to Milo Ackerman to Ian Mackay to Mike Mills to Thurston Moore. People who make all kinds of music have nothing but good things to say about the Minutemen in this documentary. And it's another two disc set, a lot of bang for the buck. The first disc is of course the documentary and the second disc houses 62 live songs taken from three concert performances. Econo My Ass, highly recommended. Up next, Not a Photograph, The Mission of Burma Story, another great documentary, No Frills, very much akin to We Jam Econo, somewhat akin to the Turbo Negro documentary as it chronicles the reunion of Mission of Burma after their long layoff. As someone who saw the reconstituted Mission of Burma, they hadn't lost a step. There are so many great archival performances here of the band playing way back when. And it is very rewarding to see a band that never got attention back in the day, finally reaping the rewards in the form of meeting all of these fans that have been waiting decades to tell these guys how much they love them. And that's all in here. Anyone who's seen my Mission of Burma episode knows how much I love them. And this does them justice. And finally, Stories, Tales, Lies, and Exaggerations, which is a story of Sublime, the band. There was a period of time where I totally loved Sublime. Brad was already dead, unfortunately. It's really hard not to think about Sublime and just feel like all of us were robbed. The band got robbed, Brad's wife got robbed, Brad's son got robbed, anyone who likes really great music got robbed. Stay off drugs, kids. This has live concert footage, but it also has behind the scenes footage. It has people talking about them growing up, including the band members' parents. 
Again, it's very lo-fi, but the spirit of the band comes through. And you get the impression that Sublime, as an organization, was more of a family than they were a band. And I'm not just talking about the guys on stage. It was the guys that helped produce their records and the people in the audience. When Sublime made it, it was kind of like that whole little click made it. It's a sweet documentary. So check out Stories, Tales, Lies, and Exaggerations when you can. That is it. Thank you for joining me. If you enjoyed this video, please do me a favor and click the like button. And don't forget to subscribe. And I will see you next week with a lot more cool stuff.